Stanford University. And what I want to talk to you all about today is, um, in a way, just a semantic variation on other ideas that have got more and more popular over the last 15 years or so. You've heard them in terms like choice architecture, which we now have a group in the federal government that leads. Out of the White House, we have a group uh, in the United Kingdom that does this behavioral design um, or choice architecture or choice um, economics of some sort, behavioral economics they call it sometimes. And so I started looking at these terms like behavioral economics, about choice architecture, and I started working with people like Joanna and other people that are in different fields, particularly the architectural field and the field of food, which is where I come out of uh, nutrition, behavior, that sort of thing. And there were things about it that bothered me. And it's interesting because as I spoke to the panel about this, there were terms that came up that I was struggling with and working with things like a farmer's markets. And there were terms like using the word consumer. And I felt uncomfortable on graphs to try to, how do you fit in the word consumer? And so I started to go into the word citizen. And then there were books published, there were books like um, Nudge, which we all felt really good about. We felt really good about the idea of adjusting defaults so that everyone just makes the healthy choice. Just take away the unhealthy choices and you'll make the healthy choice. But I started to get this concern that we weren't really building citizens, that we're really building somewhat of a mindless consumer base where you would just go out and make the better choice that was for your health, but you weren't really conscious about those choices. And that's what I want to talk to, today, to, talk to a little bit about today. And I'm, the panelists here are going to respond a little bit to this. They're going to bring their own specific fields in. This is a very field-specific thing. What I've done with behavioral design is I've tried to push it up to a high-level rubric above Behavioral, um, behavioral economics, which is an economic area, above um, choice architecture, which is not an architectural field at all, which is one of the areas that people started to bug me about it. My architect friends were like, you just can't use the word architecture whenever you want to. Um, I don't know why not. I'm not an architect. Um, this is a very old idea. So when you talk about, um, and it's also, this is my slide that sort of points out that it, although it's subtle, uh, it's grand. Um, We'll go back to that. Um, so behavior and design are two ancient ideas. When people started writing, they started talking about behavior and they started talking about design, i.e. the quote from Plato on the first one, somewhat quote. Um, behavior is one of those interesting terms that wherever you look, that there's no definition for. And there's just, just not consistent. But in general, this is what we're talking about. We're talking about the innate or learned reactions or actions to stimuli. And I'll say when I talk about any of these terms and everything you hear today, you need to put it in at least four domains. And that's the singular and the plural and the active and the reactive. And you need to keep those ideas. So when you say innate or, innate or learned, well, you're really talking two different sides of things. You're talking about action or inaction. It's two different sides of things. Because, and then it's also within the individual world of you, but it's also in the group world. It's a little bit difficult but it's, it helps you understand why these ideas are important. Design, um, what are the design principles? It's interesting because um, designers have the same principles they've had for, like I say, three millennia. Um, few fields, you know, nutrition is 100 years old or so, so it's strange to be looking at fields that matured not decades ago or centuries ago, but millennia ago. Um, so working on bringing these two ideas together and saying, where does behavior, which is the human's interaction with their world, fit into how their world is being built and organized by, by other humans, by other intentions, by efficiency, and so forth? And I'm th really throwing up th four different initial uh, principles to where things can emerge from that I'd like the panel to sort of respond to. And we've already sort of had this conversation, so the, but these are a little bit... Um, out of context for them, so it's going to be a little challenging. But they're going to also speak from their own ex experience. And so the first one would be, OK, so I put all these on gradients as well. Again, you have the singular, plural, inner, outer, and then you put them on gradients. So we're not talking about temperature, hot or cold, but a, but a relationship between them. So what is the hot and cold environment? What do I mean here? What I mean by is the influence of the environment. Some environments are very conducive to you being interactive with them, OK, like a phone. Others are very, that's a cool environment. That's when you're cool, you're involved. And this is a McLuhan idea. Some are very hot. This is a relatively hot environment, or it's supposed to be. You all are supposed to be listening to me right now. 
So I'm controlling the environment. I'm a hot environment right now. I don't really want that. I really want to make this a more cool environment. I want you all to interact with me. I think you learn better and think better and participate better that way. But we all need to think about how much awareness and intention you really want to have. How much effort do you want to put into everything? When you drive to work, do you want to think about every turn or do you just want to do it? When you go to put on a seatbelt, minimal effort. It's not something you want to think about. So we don't want to design environments where you have to think through or be aware of everything. So the awareness gradient and the intention gradient do need to vary. It's not a given that we just simply need to make you aware of everything. That would exhaust you. You won't make it through the day making decisions if you have to be aware of everything. If every time you do something, your attention has to be at the very top level, you'll burn out. But there are times in our world that we want the awareness and the intention to be high. And within that, we want the, the transparency of why and how things are designed to be high. And I believe that's what changes us from being consumers to being citizens, okay? To be actively participant in our world. And I'm turning this over to Joanna here. Um, let's see how this works. There we go. And this is, again, a subtle, but it's grand, okay? <laughs> okay. Um, good morning. It's great to be here. Um, I run the Center for Active Design, and we are architects, actually, so we can say it. Um, so what is an architect or what is a designer doing speaking at a food conference? Um, so active design is really um, an area where we've taken health evidence and we've translated this into design um, strategies. And then we've been working with cities, we've been working with real estate developers and the design community to really start to change design thinking to be aware of the effect that the design of our built environment, our buildings, um, the, our interior spaces actually has on uh, people's behavior, people's choices. Um, the choices that we're particularly interested in are around physical activity, getting people to walk more, getting people to bike more, getting people to go to the park. Um, and there's a lot of evidence around how we can make this more desirable. So just as this morning we were talking about deliciousness, um, there's a lot of parallels with the design of the built environment, and there we talk about desire. We want you to want to walk down that street. We don't want you to have to walk down that street, or we don't want to make you walk down that street, but we want to design it so that you want to experience that street. You want to walk up that stair because it's enticing, and you want to experience um, changing levels, seeing the light. Um, and so that is the idea behind active design and extends to food as well. So when we talk about food, we're really talking about um, placing food and giving you access to food in a way that you want to interact with it. So we really don't talk about nutrition, but, but access to the food. Um, so ah, the green one, yeah, it would be. Um, so some of the evidence, that's, there's a lot of evidence around the choices we make as far as food choices and how design plays into this. Um, there's a lot of studies, and we are actually also advertising our afternoon session. So come and talk more about this, and we'll really go into the evidence and, and really uh, talk more about the, spe the specific uh, research that's, that's behind these theories. But we know that color, location, light, light has a massive, massive influence on your decision to pick up a product in a grocery store, to choose that product in a cafeteria. Uh, Walmart, our favorite retailer, did a, a really actually incredible study around uh, natural lighting and how it actually increased the sale of whatever product was in that naturally lit space by 40%. So, I mean, you can use that for good, you can use that for evil, um, but it is amazing, 40%, and it was actually repeated with other retailers because nobody really believed the numbers because they're so significant, um, but it was actually repeated. Um, so these kind of uh, ideas are not new to retail industry, they're not new to, to chefs and so on, color, and the, the way that something is modeled because of the lighting really does actually give us cues. Proximity also, a lot of, a lot of uh, research around cafeterias, um, just, just the proximity of actually reaching for that food makes a difference as to how often you select it. Um, these kind of uh, ideas uh, are, are something that we want to be really conscious of. So they definitely affect us. Design definitely has an influence on the choices we're making, but how do we use that in a way that we're more conscious? How do we as designers, how do you as food experts, how do you actually use that to change uh, behavior? Um, I was reading a stat that all we're looking for is about a shift of 100 calories a day 
throughout the population. And that would be enough to have op offset the obesity epidemic that we have and that we've seen over the last 20 years. Um, finally, just this is what we do day in, day out, is really the design of the built environment. We spend a lot more time talking about streets, proximity to parks, and so on. A fabulous study that just came out last week around the effect of our built environment and food access on adolescent girls. Massive correlation between the risk of obesity and chronic disease in girls as they reach adolescent and where they live. Um, we know this, but there are specific things we can do and really look at um, as far as the design of, of where we live uh, to affect real uh, choices. So that's what we're going to be talking about a lot more this afternoon. This is just a little intro. And Sylvie, do you the next? Okay. Um, uh, my name is Sylvia Worley. Uh, user experience designer at a digital firm called Razorfish. And so we work with all different types of clients and the types of projects that we tend to work on are screen-based. And I have the, the fortune of working with an online grocer called Fresh Direct. Um, a lot of you people may or may not be from the East Coast here, but Fresh Direct is an online grocer that, um, which is the green button, okay. <laughs> is an online grocer that's been a disruptor in the sort of grocery business for, for many years, for 12 years. And if we think about um, the sort of the, the continuum that we've seen of people using digital tools to do everything from, you know, ordering uh, a book to, you know, getting their uh, delivery of their takeout. That's just sort of pervasive because we all walk around with computers in our hands now, right? So what's really interesting about um, our, a company like Fresh Direct is that they're, uh, ultimately their intention is, and their origin of their, their story is that they wanted to find the best way to bring, from the farm, bring the freshest possible food to the customer. And so it ultimately takes out what we, what we think about as going to the grocery store where you don't really know where your food is actually coming from. Um, you may, there may be some, you know, material there. It may be available to understand what farm it came from. But by and large, most of us shop at these sort of industrialized grocery stores. And so what's interesting for digital is that suddenly you have a very different way to talk to people and possibly nudge, nudge them into making different types of food choices. Um, what's interesting about um, Fresh Direct is that they're, um, they offer every type of product. So they're, they're not like a Whole Foods where they will only offer only a certain standard or organic. And I think this is a particularly interesting point to make, which is that in order for a solution um, to really start working, it needs to be able, like I need to be able to go there and get my Cheerios and, and potentially get things that are of a price point that are important to my family. Um, they may not be organic, but there are sort of this, this sort of halo that allows you to um, through digital actually surface things that are, might be more relevant. And ultimately this whole idea of, and I love the sort of del deliciousness that we, you know, we started out with today, which is the whole notion of how can, how can uh, digital start nudging you to be like, oh, I actually want, want to make this. It doesn't seem so difficult because I think generally what we've seen in our society is that we're so overwhelmed with choice. We want to eat healthfully, but we simply just don't understand how to do it. And so wouldn't it be great to be able to ultimately spend less time doing the thing that we consider a chore, which is going to the grocery store, making the list. Um, and we know that generally people spend you know, between one and four hours going to a physical store. And we know that this involves you know, going in your car, this involves taking time away from your family. Um, wouldn't it be great to be able to, to do this in such an easy way? Um, but I think what's really interesting also about digital is to be able to think about personalization. Um, what's important for my family and what's important for your family might be, might be similar, but might be nuanced. So how can we, in digital, begin through implicit and ex explicit behavior understand um, what you need. So we can, uh, the moment you arrive uh, into a shopping experience, we can surface the staples and we can get them right into your cart. So you're not actually spending all the time looking for the toilet paper and going down the virtual aisles. As we know, it's very time consuming, right? Um, but get you to, oh wow, I didn't realize I could get this quick meal kit and actually feed my family really freshly, but really easily. 
And again, it's by doing things like giving them access to information. And this is all the stories that, that you can tell around a food. When you're in a traditional grocery store, it's, you're, it's very overwhelming. There's not time for you to be able to linger in an aisle and you see the classic example is the cereal aisle, right? Where it's just like a spectrum of colors. But how can you really understand where it's coming from? Or do you even have the cognitive um, ability in that moment to, to understand that? So what Fresh Direct does is they immediately surface really important things. They have a an expert freshness person, uh, staff, who actually tests the produce every morning. So they give a star rating of how fresh, how fresh are the apples today. So you as a consumer can make an immediate um, decision. Um, some of the things that they do is tell stories around the farmers, and they work directly with the farmers. In fact, they tell stories of you know, the, the, the grocer uh, or the farmer on Long Island who knows when the fresh direct truck is going to arrive and then cuts the lettuce so that this, the customer on the other end is getting it super fresh. And then ultimately healthy, and I think it goes back to you can eat healthfully, but it can be delicious. And I think that's super important thing. Um, and, it'll, and digital allows you to sort of pivot what you're looking at very quickly. Um, and then time saving. I think we all would love time back in our day, right, to be able to do the things that we love, spend time with our families, um, actually cook because I think a lot of us think that we never have time to cook. Um, and then ultimately, how can we, through digital, because we know more about you as a visitor, how can we actually customize the experience so that you, we actually present you with your aisle, not with 20 aisles, to be able to get your, your groceries? So I'm excited to be here and to talk more about digital. Thank you. Um, my name is Marissa Deswalt. I am a registered dietitian. Uh, and my, oh yay, there's one of you in the room. Um, one of, um, so my personal expertise is in helping people actuate their desire to eat healthfully. Um, my background is on the individual level um, in medical nutrition therapy. Um, and most recently, I worked in the macro level in food policy in Washington uh, at the Let's Move initiative, where our goal with the First Lady was to make the healthy choice the easy choice. And what I mean by that is coming at um, the obesity problem from two angles. One is to encourage and incentivize private sector solutions into making healthy choices more accessible, um, more proliferated and normalized, as I like to say, making um, it the default choice. And the second was to increase consumer demand and uh, encouraging consumers to be the choice makers that would engender a different landscape of food. And what I found is, uh, is that people, as we've said already, are really confused about what the healthy choice actually is. Turns out that 80% of Americans uh, have uh, decision paralysis in the grocery store because they're not confident in the choices they need to make. Well, I've, started, I've got a nutrition degree and have experienced that myself. So the, the key to behavior design, um, in my experience, has been making sure that we've got the right information for people, but also increasing what we call the confidence gap uh, in their mindfulness. So my job and passion is to have people attend more to their choices, knowing that um, by making conscious ones, they'll be able to change the decision environment first, see more choices that they want in the first place, and then be able to habituate, um, by which I mean turn into habit, uh, a choice that is healthy, that they can trust as a healthy choice and don't need to think about anymore. And so right now the model's a little bit reversed, right? The, the, usually the unhealthy choice is what we've habituated and what's normal, and we wanna switch that so that the exception to the rule would be the unhealthy choice, and that when you make it, you make it consciously. Um, and that's, that's my passion and what we're here to kind of delve into today, right, Joel? Thank you, Lisa. Thank you. I'm, I'm Will Rothenzweig. Um, I got a chance to start this conversation with Joel a couple years ago, and he knows, you know, I'm just, I'm thrilled to be on a panel here with um, such thoughtful and, and talented people thinking about how to influence my habits and design my behaviors. But um, Joel knows that I bristle at the idea or the terminology of behavior design, because I just think about, you know, who's designing what 
behavior for whom. And I, I also wonder, Joel, you know, you're a great guy and you work for the government. So, um, and you're here to help me, I know. So I, I just wonder a little bit about too, like where, where's the source, you know, where is the source of responsibility in this whole effort? And I just had the good fortune of getting, um, uh, participating in a national commission, which is called the Vitality Commission, with about 20 different people from different disciplines, public policy, public health, uh, design, urban planning, uh, the food sector, uh, the investment sector, looking at the linkage between economic vitality and human well-being and vitality. And there's a direct correlation between the, the, a country's ability to innovate and, and grow in a healthy manner and its healthcare costs. I mean, it's not, it's not a mystery anymore. We spend 17% of GDP on healthcare costs, treating illnesses, probably 80% or more of which could be prevented through influence of healthy behavior. Uh, and we realize that as a country, we'll never, the United States will never lead again in the way it did once with the burden of disease that we have currently. So we're all, you know, aspiring to, to work on this problem together. I, um, instead of slides, I just brought a couple of things I wanted to share with you. The Vitality Commission produced a couple of documents which you might find really interesting. Um, we, we did a map with the Institute of the Future here in uh, Palo Alto, and we looked at the ecosystem of all the tools. Like nobody even mentioned Fitbits or um, Jawbones or, you know, the whole world of quantified self um, merging with um, uh, behavior design, merging with new business models. It's just a fascinating world. You might find this map really interesting. We also produced a report, a whole report of recommendations about investing in prevention, a national imperative. This is all at thevitalityinstitute.org. You can download it all. If you see me later, I can probably get one of these hard copies sent to you. But, um, you know, I guess I, I just, I had a couple other thoughts. This um, personalization is going to be really important. Creating a culture of health, like what the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation is really trying to promote. I think a lot more about how in our lives, how we're really influenced by the people who care about us and love us, and the power of encouragement, you know, that one-to-one um, -one encouragement is just so powerful. And I think we're learning a lot more around the evidence of that, where, you know, people in groups tend to associate with people that are like them, but it's difficult to kind of mix that up and cross-pollinate in a way that, you know, healthier behaviors or the kinds of inspiration can come from within, you know? And this week, I just started to think about going on a multitasking moratorium. How many people here are, are like just corrupted with their, their device? You know, so I started by putting my Twitter, LinkedIn, and Facebook apps in another folder on my iPhone. I was just doing my own behavior design. I put them in a folder and then I put it like on the third screen on my iPhone, okay? To make it a lot harder for me just to go, you know, look, what's, what's, ha what's tweeting, what's, you know? So really interesting. So I start cutting down on this. So what happens? The last three days, who have I heard from? Facebook. You haven't checked your news feed. <laughs> They're nudging me. I think it's nudging. It's, it's kind of, it's kind of a pain in the ass, but anyway, they have an, they have, they, I'm not sure, they have an altruistic ambition to make me, um, you know, not multitask, but it just makes me think that we all have to become, you know, there, there's, a, there's a risk of becoming mindless in this effort of behavior design, and I think we just have to become more mindful, and figure out how to get there. So, Will, Greg, I'll say that it's interesting working for the government, and I do work for the government for the Center for Disease Control, as Chris said, and I, I bring that up. But um, so far this morning, we've had the government, why don't you do more? And the government, why don't you do less? So it's classic. I always tell people I'm right in the middle between those who want more and those who want less. Um, quit asking. Um, but there's something called cognitive burden. 
that I'd like to hear a few comments from the panel about real quick here in the minutes we have left. And that's what, in a way, design is supposed to reduce, is and you wake up in the morning, you have a certain amount of behavior-making energy that you're going to do all day long, your choice, your choice ability all day long. And as you get towards the end of the day, your choices get worse and worse, and by Friday afternoon, you're out at a bar making really bad choices. Um, so we organize our world so that we save some of that for making the choices that are important. And the idea behind behavior design is not to manipulate. That's the idea behind uh, behavioral economics or behind choice architecture, but behavioral design is to open up mindfulness for people and bring in enough intention and awareness to really allow people to decide individually by individualizing when they make and want to make specific choices that are worth more cognitive burden. Mm. And I'm going to turn this right back to Will and then come down this way with it. I'm going to turn it over to um, Sylvia. Well, one thing that you said that was super interesting, because I did a similar experiment with myself with the, the digital media, um, and it sort of worked. I still felt like I went back to Facebook and Instagram. But what, I, what particularly struck me, Marissa, that, that you said, which is, wouldn't it be an amazing world where we lived where you didn't have to think about um, certain decisions? And ultimately, it's sort of like, how can how could we, and I think about Facebook as being, it's this constant two-way communication, and if we can think about having a digital tool that's an in and out, or a set it and forget it, meaning I'm not, I'm not using it, I'm not expecting constant, mm. you know, and I call Facebook the slow drip, which is, it, that's what it is. It's like it's, you're, it's, you're never gonna get it off your back, because it's just, it, yeah. So <laughs> could, it, could there be a solution that helps you to set it and forget it for, for good choices that are basic, basics, table stakes choices, so that leaves you time to discover interesting things like, oh, I didn't know I could use mushrooms to decrease my sodium. Like, that's really interesting to me as a, as a cook, and maybe I can do something with my family. But I, I feel like there's something there to be able to, to do that. And again, it's not a... It's not a two-way, it doesn't necessarily need to be two-way. And two-way is a lot of burden for people. It needs to be, I think, something where you can just set it and forget it. I think yeah, there's something I, really cultural I I in this. I was just going to add, you know, I was, there, there was a great article in the New York Times this week um, about a woman in Japan who's written a book about organizing your stuff. Did anybody see this? And she talks about, you know, when you go into your closet and you look at your clothes, you do this kind of spiritual practice of looking at a piece of clothing and asking yourself, does this spark joy? You know, and if it doesn't spark joy, get rid of it. And so, you know, it, it struck me that there's, there's kind of, um, there's an opportunity for enlightenment, you know, just around the corner. But we're so distracted here in the United States, and I'm, I'm sure we're not alone, but like, how do we cut through that distraction and not have this cognitive burden with, you know, layered on with more behavioral design? Yeah, there's definitely, you know, this is a big problem, and just a show of hands, you know, who pauses in front of the kitchen cabinet in the morning wondering what should mm -hmm. I have for breakfast, right? Mm -hmm. It starts right in the morning. And if you have coffee, that's suppressing your appetite, so you don't have to think about it. But <laughs> later on, it hits you. And the idea of decreasing cognitive load, especially around nutrition, is there's so much information out there. And because there's so much information, um, there's also misinformation mm -hmm. as we're trying to make absolute decisions around food. Um, what I am really thinking about right now and wrestling with is how we help people who don't decrease the cognitive load as a stressful burden and increase their empowered decision making so that when they see this choice in my food day, in my food world, actually demands some attention, they take a pause and consciously wrap their mind around it. Um, about half of the decisions you make every day are already habits as is. How can I take help folks take more of the habituated, unconscious decision making around their food choices in an arena of misinformation and put it into the cognitive space where they are more mindful, where they're empowered to make their own decisions. And this is based on you know, a concept that's pretty simple. You, nobody knows your body the way you do. And if you know your hunger cues, your satiety cues, if you know and are in touch with how food makes you feel, your energy levels throughout the day, you're gaining a lot of data on what inputs are affecting your outputs. And if I can 
if we can increase consciousness around that, then you've got a feedback loop that's going constantly, and you can tip into uh, unconsciousness and switch it to consciousness. Um, there's ways of doing that in behavior design. Your work is phenomenal in that space and really helpful to us dietitians. Um, but uh, the food piece is really critical because nutrition, you know, it's a hot topic and everybody's learning more about their food. John, can you? Sure, just a, just a quick comment. And I think that something that we're really interested in is, is giving people the opportunity to make those mm -hmm. choices. So making it part of their daily routine isn't always possible depending on where you live and what you're exposed to. And we know that that has a phenomenal effect on the choices you make. So really like understanding the, the power that proximity has and the power that what you see every day and what you're exposed to um, will actually influence what becomes your habit. How do we change those daily routines? Um, we, we do actually know how to do it using design, um, but how do we make that the norm? How do we reach everybody? Um, there's definitely an equity issue which we haven't really touched on. Yeah. It's something that we're very um, conscious of and cognizant of is that um, we really need to affect the entire population. This is a public health issue we're talking about, so it's not an individual choice issue. It is actually, it is actually all of us that, that need to change this. Um, so I think that just kind of bringing it back to public there, health. Is there the potential for everyone to be their own designer? <laughs> <laughs> that would be an interesting I, I, process. I think that's the future, right? <laughs> we need to be our own designer. Um, so finishing up here, we are having afternoon sessions. Please come and talk to us about this if you have ideas or thoughts. We also are looking, we have a position at CDC, a fellows position. We're opening up uh, on behavior design. Um, a master's or a PhD student, um, come join us um, in Atlanta. It'll be fun. And uh, several things that have been mentioned today um, are at these links, and I'm sure these slides are available somehow through the program. Thank you. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.